WhatsApp chats. What's interesting is that they knew that WhatsApp was the, the place where you do secure communications, but they didn't know about Signal. So they read through all of his WhatsApp chats, but none of his Signal chats. So essentially, I can't really tell you, use such and such a tool and you will be perfectly secure. Instead of what security really is, it's taking lots of different tools, adjusting the tools to your situation and figuring out what are the trade-offs we are willing to do and how much harm can a bad actor cause us, okay? So there's no such thing as perfect security. Every security just sort of protects us from a certain sophistication of an attack. So I could, like, I locked the doors to my house. And if somebody wanted to steal my laptop, they could still theoretically, you know, get a couple of ex-special forces soldiers, get down from a helicopter, jump from a helicopter, parachute onto my roof, drill a hole in my roof, climb through the hole, get on my laptop and run away like that. But this is such an expensive attack that closing my doors with a key makes almost every attack impracticable. And fortifying my roof would be very, very expensive, right? So almost like for every case, uh, when it comes to every attack, the main question that we have to ask is, what are my limits? What is the worst threat that can happen to me? And what mitigations am I ready to take? I'm more than happy to afterwards share a couple of materials. I'll also share some materials with the organizers about how exactly threat modeling works and what sort of steps we need to think about when we do it. I really, really love this slide. Your threat model is not my threat model. Like it's, I think it's hilarious. And I think that it does illustrate pretty well. Oh, I see nobody laughing. I think it does illustrate pretty well that sort of, you know, everybody will be scared of very, very different things. So once again, if you're, for example, the New York public school system, you will need to take a lot more steps to either secure Zoom or to jump to something else. Why? Because for you, people breaking into Zoom can be disastrous. For us, people breaking into Zoom just means that we need to reschedule the meeting by half an hour or by an hour. So yeah, on to everybody's favorite section, secure messaging. I mean, I'm sure that we've all, so, so th those are just some of the main apps used for secure messaging. There's Facebook Messenger, there's WhatsApp, there's Apple Messages, known also by its old name, iMessage. There's Telegram, there's Wire, there's Signal. And that's just a couple of them. Now, each one of those apps will have very, very different encryption protocols. Well, not all of them. Some of them share encryption protocols. Each one of those apps will have slightly different defaults and slightly different standards. Some of them back up your data on the cloud, some of them do not. Facebook Messenger in general does, unless you're doing a private chat, does sort of tie all of your data and all of the communications to your Facebook account. So if, for example, somebody breaks into your Facebook account and logs into it, they could read all of your messages. And it's sort of this cloud archive function alone that Facebook breaks and break-ins can happen, but does make what the, does make Facebook Messenger, at least in non-private chats, pretty, pretty insecure, right? WhatsApp, on the other hand, as long as you disable cloud backups, is very different. Because with WhatsApp, what happens is the data stays on your phone. So what it means is that there is no account that somebody can break into. Uh, theoretically, somebody could break into your iCloud account or something, but in general, sort of, it's pretty rare. It's very, very rare for WhatsApp accounts to be broken into, much, much, much more rare than Facebook accounts. Also, okay. Facebook doesn't use end-to-end -end encryption by default, whereas okay. WhatsApp does. So essentially, sort of WhatsApp messages are read in such a way, and they are sent and encrypted in such a way that WhatsApp cannot read the content. The only thing that WhatsApp can read is who's sending the messages to whom. And we'll get to that in a moment. Apple Messages is a pretty interesting one. It's considered pretty, pretty secure. I... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's considered pretty, pretty secure. There are a couple of flaws in it. It's tied to the cloud. So if somebody breaks into your cloud account, they could theoretically download the Apple messages. But I've been pretty impressed with the security of Apple messages recently, with a couple of exceptions, but we will not get into them right now. Essentially, like if you, for example, a very high profile journalist, you probably should be using WhatsApp or Signal instead of Apple messages. But for most of the population, I think that Apple messages are pretty much okay. Telegram's a particularly fun one. I think that Telegram is the one that all of us enjoy hating, and for very good reasons. Telegram very early on committed a huge amount of mistakes with its crypto. One of the big mistakes that Telegram did was they were rolling 
uh, they were rolling sort of their own crypto. And the, the number one rule of cryptography is never roll your own crypto. So essentially, with WhatsApp and Signal are using a very established, very well-known encryption protocol, Telegram has not been using it. Not only this, but Telegram has had a pretty bad way. I see this a question. I will, I will let you, I will answer it in a moment. But like Telegram has also had pretty weird security marketing. So essentially, Telegram security marketing has been we have a bug bounty. So if somebody manages to break Telegram's encryption, people will pay you. They like Telegram will pay you, let's say three hundred thousand dollars or something like this. There's a problem with this. The first one is that if you did break Telegram's encryption, you could probably sell that hack to a government agency for much more than Telegram can pay you. And the second thing is that Telegram sort of for a long time would use the bug bounties as proof that they are secure. And this is very, very weird. It's a bit like me saying, I will pay 50 euros to anybody who breaks into my car and steals my laptop. And then if by the end of the week, nobody has broken into my car and stolen my laptop, I will say my laptop is perfectly secure. It's not. It's just that in order to get break into my car, you need to get into the car park, which is guarded. You need to take lots and lots of different steps. You need to break the window. You need to know which one my car is. So in all of those cases, the cost of this attack exceed 50 euros. So the thing that I've proven with this sort of bug bounty is that the cost of stealing my laptop is more than 50 euros. I have not proven that my laptop is perfectly secure. So this sort of deceitful marketing by Telegram has been very, very weird. And I definitely wouldn't trust companies that are using bug bounties as a proof of security. Like lots of companies use bug, bug bounties and it's good practice, but just because nobody has collected your bounty does not mean that you're secure. It just means that the cost of an attack is higher. You might, for example, need to hire, let's say, 10 cryptography experts for a year who definitely cost more than, you know, $300,000, but which would be within the reach of most government agencies. You'd need to hire such people. It, so all a bug bounty that's been uncollected means is that the attack is more expensive than the bug bounty. Yes. And one of you asked if you need to, if you need apples to use Apple Messenger. Yes, I'm afraid that Apple Messenger only works on iDevices. In general, there's been a long debate on whether iDevices or Androids are more secure. Last year, I would definitely have said that iDevices are much, much more secure than Androids because in recent years, they have, like in recent months, there have been a lot of hacks of iDevices. So I can no longer say like for sure whether or not Androids or iDevices are not secure. I would still lean to iDevices just a bit more because they do receive very, very quick and very, very regular updates and they are kept up to date for much longer. Then afterwards, like after the Telegram logo, the Telegram is the one that looks like the little kite, is the one that's like the, whoo, the swirl. The swirl is Wire. So Wire is a really interesting app because it's one of the only ones here that does not require a phone number, but only requires a username. And for a lot of people, giving out the phone number can be a really, really big problem. So for example, in some jurisdictions, in some countries, if you give out your, like your phone number is tied to a government database. So the government will know who's behind this phone number. For some journalists and activists, this could be a huge deal breaker. So Wire is a pretty good alternative. And I've been working with a lot of groups that, for example, don't want to share the phone numbers at all because they are scared of other attacks using phone numbers. And for them, Wire is ideal. And the Wire encryption is pretty good as well. Like it's probably the same level as WhatsApp. It, it is the same level as WhatsApp and Signal. And finally, the little purple logo, Signal has slightly changed its logo, is Signal. Signal in general has the reputation of being the most secure out of all of the platforms. And in part, it's due to very, very strict defaults, right? So you can't really use, you can't back up Signal chats on an iDevice. You can back them up on Android, but it's difficult. Signal has disappearing messages and Signal just has really, really strong default settings. So for example, WhatsApp will save images by default to your phone, like to your camera roll, to your saved images folder. Signal doesn't do this. So Signal is very, very similar to WhatsApp in terms of the encryption program, the encryption scheme, but it just has all those little defaults, like not saving images by default or having the option for disappearing messages that just makes it a bit, bit more secure to use in everyday life and makes it much, much more difficult to actually make a mistake. 
And as we'll see very soon, defaults matter. Defaults matter a, a lot. One final fun thing about Signal is that Signal is the, probably the only platform out of all of those that doesn't collect metadata. So essentially metadata is who's messaging whom. So for example, Facebook servers, if I'm, for example, going to be messaging Frank, right? Then I need to tell the servers, oh, somebody just asked me what's the most secure messenger. Like, as I told you, it depends. Like, it depends on what your situation is. For most people, I would definitely recommend Signal. If you are in a community where Signal is seen as paranoid, if you're in a community where you'd be seen as suspicious using Signal, I'd say use WhatsApp because WhatsApp is used as by everybody. And therefore WhatsApp is very, very standard and very, very unsuspicious. If you are in a community where everybody is using Signal or having an unusual messaging app is not seen as bad or weird or will not draw attention to you, I'd say use Signal. But if you're very, very uncomfortable with giving out your phone number, use Wire. So essentially, if you're okay with using your phone number, WhatsApp or Signal, if not, then Wire. I'm also getting a couple of questions about Viber. Now, Viber, I'm afraid I, I know very little about. I would be very reluctant to recommend Viber for one reason, and this is that very little has been written about it. So most of the security researchers who have been around and have been writing have been focusing on Telegram, they've been focusing on Wire, they've been focusing on Signal, WhatsApp, and Apple Messages. Very few of them have been focusing on Viber, so there just haven't been as many attempts, as many analysis of Viber security as there have been for the other platforms. So for just this reason alone, I would definitely recommend it. Yes, I know. Oh, you're just writing that Viber is the most popular messaging app in Greece. Yes, I understand. It's the most popular messaging app in a lot of places. And I really hope that there will be more security analysis done of it soon. But until this happens, I would probably recommend WhatsApp or Signal. Yeah, and with metadata very quickly, right? If, for example, I am delivering, let's say, a WhatsApp message to Frana, then a WhatsApp doesn't know the content of the message, but it knows that I'm sending a message to Franak, and I send those messages very often, of course. Uh, but Signal doesn't actually collect any metadata, which is a really, really cool feature. So Signal can actually relay a message from me to Franak without knowing who I am or who Franak is. This took a lot of cryptographic work. This is essentially magic, but it also means that if somebody, for example, took over Signal servers, or if somebody was inside Signal, they couldn't see that Franak and I am, are messaging. They wouldn't just be able to not see the, the contents of the messages. They would also not be able to see the metadata. And for some reason, like for most people, this might be a like level of security and paranoia that's too high. If, for example, you have very, very highly skilled adversaries or want the highest level of protection, it's probably a really, really interesting feature to look out for. But yeah, for all of those things, you need to think about your use case and your threat model. And one of the piece of security advice that you usually get from people is like, don't do cloud backups. And you know, what? for a lot of people, this is really impracticable advice. Because a lot of security people will sort of be saying, okay, uh, delete all your messages very regularly, never do any backups of your messages, just like keep your whole life a secret. But we don't always want to keep a whole life secret. We have so much valuable communication. We've got photos of our loved ones. We've got exchanges about pets. We've got so many beautiful moments that are being shared on all of those platforms. And a lot of us, sorry, I was just checking, it's not raining, it's almost raining. So, and yeah, and for a lot of us, like no, backups can be really, really crucial. So one of the things that you could, for example, do is have like one app where you do have backups, have one app where everything's saved to the cloud, have one app where you sort of just, you know, share family memories and the like, so, and then have another app, which you have for like maximum security. So this way, there are, there's an app where you can, for example, share things that you really don't want to get deleted. And you can have another app, which you share, where you just share the super secure stuff that gets deleted, let's say after half an hour. But where you can sort of, you know, split your stuff between apps and have one of the apps where you keep like all your precious memories and important things, and another app where you just share some high security stuff. So I've been working with people who've been using WhatsApp and Signal for this. So for example, they've been using Signal chats for the very secure stuff. And there, for example, the chat gets auto-deleted after a day. So even if the phone was seized, nobody could see it. 
And they have WhatsApp chat backed up to the cloud, or like iMessage backed up to the cloud for all those precious moments that they do want to keep. Uh, somebody wrote to me about Zoom. I will talk to you about Zoom later on because Zoom is a really, really interesting case. But yeah, as I was saying, for most people, Signal, Wire, and WhatsApp are pretty, pretty ideal. So I know that I do have a couple more questions about iCloud. In general, for iCloud, please, please, please make sure that your two-factor authentication settings are up to date and you should be okay. I think that not having cloud backup is much, much better, right? So for example, I would say you see, if you absolutely want to have cloud backups, for example, for photos of your, I don't know, family that you share from vacations or something, you can share them on like a less secure platform that's hooked up to the cloud where you can save all the photos. But for confidential stuff, I definitely wouldn't do any cloud backups whatsoever. Another very important thing is like a lot of us are sharing stuff in groups. And never forget that just if the app is secured and it's encrypted, it just means that your messages cannot be read while they are in transit, while they are flowing. But the moment the message is on somebody's device, it can be read. So essentially, if you, for example, in a, so for example, if I'm messaging to Franak, but if Franak were to leave his phone unlocked, it means that somebody could still see the messages that I sent to Franak. So one of the things that we could do to limit this is, for example, to implement disappearing messages. Another thing that we could also, another thing that we also need to be very aware of is be very, very careful of who is in our WhatsApp groups, our Signal groups, our app message groups. It's very, very easy for people to join groups. It's often difficult to notice when somebody has joined a group, and you never know if somebody who has, who is in a group, couldn't potentially be taking screenshots, leaking, or whatever. So just be super careful of who's in your groups. And I would say be very, very careful the moment you have a slightly bigger group of sharing confidential information in this. A great example of this was the Turkish coup. There was a Bellingcat study uh, by which they obtained a video of somebody just recording themselves, scrolling through the chats of all of the generals, I believe, who were planning and coordinating the coup that happened in Turkey some time ago. What essentially happened was that the WhatsApp group was so big that one of the plotters ended up recording a photo of himself scrolling through all of the conversations. And therefore all of the conversations were leaked very, very easily. So like don't think that cannot happen to you. Be very, very careful about stuff that happens in groups because stuff will and can, can and will get leaked. Uh, Lukas, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah of course. So, yeah, I will interrupt you because there are many questions, but uh, about the situation in Turkey. So what's, what's your recommendation? Is it better that only one person have all the access and passwords and in full control over the messenger or your cloud or whatever, or everyone has the control? So where is the balance, the smart balance between like, you know, the many people who have control and one person who is like the most uh, vulnerable and when like KGB uh, make a breakdown on this person that all this private correspondence will be revealed? or to share access. Okay, so there, there's a couple of different scenarios here, right? One of those scenarios is what happens with some people's cryptocurrency wallets. And for example, some people have big crypto wallets. I understand this was explained to me once and I haven't seen this in real life, but people with like huge cryptocurrency wallets will have the password, let's say saved between five different lawyers. So that each one of those lawyers has a portion of the password, but not all of it. And all five lawyers, for example, need to meet in person in order to do the password. That's how super secure communications are done, okay? So only if they work together, yes. they have the full password. Yes, so but that's like that's like the highest level of security. What's that? Yeah, but how on the lowest level, for example, like these Turkish, uh, Turkish politicians, how, that, mm -hmm. how, how they could do better their communication? I mean, the only thing that you can do is you need to be very, very careful of whom you share any information with, right? So because this wasn't even a screenshot. This was literally somebody recorded a photo of themselves scrolling. Similarly, you know, there's nothing to, you know, similarly, for example, there's nobody, nothing to stop me taking a photo of a phone with a message from me. So even if you had some sort of software that prevents leaks or something, the photo can still happen. So the main step that you can do is restrict the size of the groups and only share information with people with whom it's absolutely, absolutely needed. 
And there's like no 100% way to prevent such leaks. The only thing that you can really do is the bigger the group and the, the higher the probability. So only share sensitive information when you absolutely need to and with as few people as possible. If it comes to stuff like personal websites or Facebook pages, make sure that the amount of administrators is as small as possible and as few people as possible have very high privileges. So I, for example, been working with NGOs who have had, uh, and we've been locking down sort of their Facebook accounts together. And one of the best steps that NGOs can take is to only have, for example, one or two people as Facebook administrators. Because if you will have, let's say, 20 people as Facebook administrators, then the chances that one of those 20 will get hacked and kick out all the other administrators is quite high. If, for example, you only have two administrators, the chance of one of them getting hacked is much, much lower. So I would say give as few people high privileges as possible. Does that, does that answer your question? Oh yeah, totally, totally. It's very <laughs> somebody, write, somebody wrote, if one lawyer died, you're screwed. And exactly. in some cases, yes. So that, then what you need to actually do is like, it, it, it's a very, very weird and difficult balance. It's, but like sort of that very, very high level security, which I would say is probably, probably outside of the case of this webinar. So yeah, the other thing that I would say is if you can, Delete, if you have sensitive content, the moment you don't need it, please delete it. And please use disappearing messages as often as possible. Signal has disappearing messages, wire has disappearing messages. If you're talking about sensitive stuff, do disappearing messages. Not because they will save you from malicious action, but because they will save you from stupid mistakes. They will save you, for example, if your phone gets searched at the border. They will, disappearing messages will not save you from the other person whom you're communicating with being evil and screenshotting your messages or taking a photo from them, but they will still save you from a lot of scenarios. They will, for example, save you from, I don't know, they will, for example, save you from somebody's phone being seized or somebody's phone being hacked and those messages still being on them. So I would say if you can, use the definitely use disappearing messages for sensitive stuff. Cool. Any more uh, questions about messaging before we move to, on to the other section? Uh, yeah, no, no, let's move, let's let's move. But are we going to let's... discuss Zoom, Zoom and Skype and other... Uh, <laughs> we uh, we will get to that in a moment, okay? Okay, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, the, the, oh, two more things, because I think that sort of, when we, when we work remotely, one of the frequent tools we use are messages, right? So previously, for example, if we wanted to send something confidential or say something confidential, we could just walk over to the other person. Now, when we use messaging, we might use Signal or WhatsApp instead. So it's very useful to think about the security of those and the trust of those. But another thing that's happening is that we really need to think about like personal devices, work devices, and which ones we use when and where. So in general, work devices are weird security-wise. In this, they give system administrators a huge, huge amount of access to a lot of your data. So for example, G Suite or Google stuff, and similarly Microsoft stuff, generally gives like the administrator of your account or your employer and others, huge amount of insights into the messages you've read, the messages that you're sending, the messages you're writing. In general, if you're using work device or work cloud, definitely don't assume that anything that you send is private. So if you, for example, sending a message to a colleague, don't assume that any of it is private, right? And in many cases, this is for very, very good reasons. For example, people are working in highly regulated industries. If you work in industry like banking, then all of your messages need to be sort of saved for legal reasons. Similarly, if you work in you know, other highly regulated um, things like civil service, government, and that, then it's very, very obvious legal reasons. But always when sort of you're chatting with people, make sure to be very, very careful when chatting on a work platform, because there is a non-zero chance that your employer could have access to it. It's sort of the same with Slack, right? So there's this article in Recode about how your Slack direct messages are not as private as you think. So I think that sort of previously, if we wanted to have a private conversation with a colleague, we'd maybe get coffee with them and like talk somewhere else with them, right? Now we want to replace it with Slack. But don't forget, the moment you're using something on your employer's system is a moment when your employer can potentially track it. So your conversations are not half as secure as your conversations over coffee were, and it's best to, um, 
it's best to sort of, you know, either move those to conversations to personal devices or, for example, have them just, you know, over quick single calls. But I would be very, very careful with some of the Slack messages and the like you sent. Another question you just sent me is, is there any specific sign to show us that our device is hacked or under surveillance? In many cases, there isn't. There can be some symptoms. So for example, if your battery starts to drain very, very quickly and your device gets hot very quickly, this might be one of the symptoms. And if this starts to happen, I would definitely wipe your phone and reinstall everything. Any sort of unusual behavior on your phone, I would be slightly scared of. On the iPhone, there's also an app called iVerify. I have not tested this app yet, so I can't really recommend it to you. I'll just type out the name. It's called... But it, it's an app that can show in some cases that there have been some attempts to break into. But once again, please do a bit of your own due diligence because like, I haven't read or tested this app just yet. If I do, I'll get back to you. So yeah, there, there are a lot of good reasons to use work devices as well especially if you're doing work things, because you usually have a security team at work and the security team will probably be quite good at making sure that, I don't know, documents are not hacked, broken into whatever. Just make sure that, you know, I would definitely say separate your personal life and your work life a bit. So definitely don't talk too much about personal life on work-related devices. Please, please don't use your corporate cloud to build your CD if you're applying somewhere else. And just be very, very careful to definitely keep personal devices and work devices separate. And some of us, when we've moved to work from home, we are working from personal devices at home. That's okay. Just keep the account separate. So if, for example, you have a work G Suite account or like a work Microsoft Office account or work Microsoft Teams, just use the work Microsoft Teams stuff for work stuff. And for example, use your Google Docs account for personal stuff. The other thing is that if, for example, your company were to close tomorrow, or if you were fired tomorrow, it also means that you'll still have access to all your files, which you wouldn't have if you had saved them on your work stuff and you got terminated. Please, please check your policies because in many places it can also be illegal to use your personal accounts for work stuff. So I definitely, I definitely am not recommending that either, also for security reasons. Somebody also wrote, if you're using GSM communication, you're surveilled, uh, it's complicated. It's complicated, it's, but I don't want to go into just today, like we can have a whole other session, but it's not, it's, sometimes it's easy to surveil G, uh, GSM communication, sometimes it's much more difficult. So now the section that we've all been waiting for, security dil due diligence or the case study of Zoom. In general, actually, it's really difficult to have encrypted video chat. And this is for one very simple reason. So video, So if you, for example, have um, ooh, password managers, I'll get to password managers at the end, okay? Can we save some of the questions at the end and then I can definitely answer that. But so, so, so video chat is actually really, really difficult to get super secure. And this is because all of us have different connection qualities. All of us have different types of connections and networks. So for example, one of you might be having a super fast network and you can see me in glorious HD. Somebody else might be having a much slower network and you can see me as a little pixelated thing and not even notice that my shirt is full of hedgehogs. But, and there's lots of people who are in between. So essentially, if we had encrypted communications with all of those, what has happened is that I would need to send out all of those different versions of all of those different streams to all of you. This would be horrible for ne network quality. This would be, very, very much a use of my computer processes. So my computer would probably overheat, my network could, would crash, and none of us could have a good chat. So for this reason, sort of the only video chat that's really, really encrypted is stuff like WhatsApp video chat, which is up to four people, or like Wire and FaceTime are also quite encrypted, but they also have huge limits. The moment you hit like the 100 participant number like for Zoom, we just don't have the technical capability to keep it encrypted because each one of you will be getting a slightly different quality of video. So as such, my stuff is being sent to Zoom server. Zoom server is sort of, you know, redoing the video in all sorts of different formats and then sending it out to you. And there are super smart people who are working on solving this problem and making sure that all of us can have end-to-end -end encrypted stuff so that not even Zoom servers could decrypt our stream. Until that happens, unfortunately, it's pretty insecure, right? 
So, Zoom security is a topic that has grown quite a bit in popularity. Here you sort of see the Google Trends page, which shows how much more people have been searching for Zoom security over the past month. The moment Zoom's popularity rose, so people have started to look at Zoom more and more. And in general, the more popular the platform, the more people will be finding flaws in the platform. So I, for example, Zoom bombing. Like Zoom bombing is something that could happen with most conference systems. Like WebEx, for example, could also be using public links. Google Hangouts could also be using public links. But what's happened is that because Zoom is the most popular solution, people have created different methodologies to be breaking into Zoom. Similarly, sort of the best, the best tweet that I saw about, I've seen a lot of great tweets on Zoom security, but one of my favorite ones is that Zoom peaked at a very, very unfortunate time because suddenly there were lots of information security professionals who are bored and working from home and trying to sort of boost the CVs by finding security holes in the next best thing. And that's definitely, definitely an issue. Yeah, somebody wrote about the Chinese, Chinese service as well, yeah. So recently, New York City has forbidden schools from using Zoom for remote learning. And this is a decision that was criticized by a lot of cryptographers because they were saying, you know what? Like everything has issues and it's kind of true. Like Zoom has made a lot of different architecture decisions that have made stuff very, very user-friendly. One of the reasons why Zoom is so great to set up is that anyone can just click the link and join. And this is super easy. This was responsible for Zoom's very, very quick growth. It also meant that people can, for example, join the meeting and disrupt it, which is why we needed to introduce things like passwords or restrict people or add a waiting group. But without those things, Zoom was frictionless. It was really, really easy to join. It was very, very usable. Not only this, but Zoom is pretty much the only platform that has amazing video quality at such a huge scale. Like when it comes to quality, Zoom is pretty much unbeaten. So once again, your security model is very, very different from somebody else's security model. What happened to us was a minor annoyance. But I understand the New York City decision. There was a really good Twitter thread on it about how if the thing that happened to us happens in a school, it's not a nuisance. It's unacceptable. If, for example, a primary school class is bombed by people who are shouting obscene things or drawing obscene images, this can have a really, really damaging effect on the whole classroom. And this is essentially very, very, very unacceptable. So whatever our situation, we really need to think what's our threat model, what are we protecting ourselves from, and how catastrophic would the effects be if we failed? Yeah. Recently, there was another big Zoom headline in that Google, I think just, it's a 9th of April, so just yesterday, Google told its Zoom employees that they cannot use Zoom on the laptops. Once again, everybody's threat model is different. I am guessing that Google would, for example, have big issues with corporate espionage. Google is a, is a place where probably lots of nation states are interested in hacking Google as well. Google is a huge, huge target it's got a huge crosshairs on it. And there's a huge amount of government, corporations, others who are just really, really interested in hacking Google. Most of us do not have Google levels of threat and Google levels of security. If you do, I would probably recommend using Zoom on a different device because Zoom has been pretty badly coded and has left a lot of security holes. But most of us are not Google. And I think that for most of us sort of our threat model is not quite as big as Zoom's threat model is. So why do we hate Zoom anyway? A couple of things. The first one is it's been coded badly. Like Zoom was meant to grow very, very quickly. And like many, many startups, they were expanding very, very quickly at the cost of security features. So the amount of, there's been a huge amount of security holes being found in Zoom recently. In part, this has been due to the fact that there's been a huge amount of scrutiny and security researchers have gotten super interested in Zoom now that everybody's using it. But Zoom also made some pretty bad decisions. In fact, just last year, Zoom installed a permanent web server on the Apple devices. This was so bad and created such a big security hole that Apple actually issued a software update to remove Zoom functionality like that, okay? 
Like if you are a major corporation and the operating system provider thinks that you are such a threat because of the hacks that you've used and the coding techniques that you've used, but they are essentially literally <laughs> installing an OS update in order to prevent your functionality, you know that something weird is happening and you know that something bad is happening, right? So I'll just turn the light back. The other issue that could be happening is Zoom bombing. And we've seen this. I think that in many ways, Zoom bombing could be happening with any platform. And Zoom had the great ability that joining meetings is easy and frictionless. This meant that a lot of bad actors could join as well. In the past, Zoom bombing wasn't that much of an issue. Now there have been, for example, specialized tools that can develop Zoom bombing as well. So Zoom bombing is definitely, definitely an issue. And hopefully later on, we can actually do another seminar on how to protect it and how to secure Zoom. Because the Zoom has a lot of pretty bad defaults and defaults matter. But I think that none of those things would have annoyed us that much. What really annoyed a lot of us, both in security and elsewhere, is that Zoom was at best miscommunicating. So most of you will see a little green E with a lock in your Zoom setting. And Zoom claimed to be using end-to-end -end encryption. Now, in security terms, end-to-end -end encryption means that Zoom cannot, Zoom is physically unable to read the contents of your messages or of your video chat. And Zoom sort of promoted itself as having end-to-end -end encryption. Now, the issues, they kind of had it, but only for text chats, where the video was unencrypted. So they were pretty much, they were, they were doing something that was pretty akin to false advertising. And in general, in security, if somebody's lying about something like having end-to-end -end encryption, you don't really trust them, because there's a huge amount of other things that they could be lying about as well. So Zoom does not have a particularly good record. They have security bugs. A lot of security bugs have been found in the past uh, week or so. They've been pretty much lying about encryption and they haven't reintroduced really settings for Zoom bombing and the like. In many cases, they have like a set of default settings and those default settings are optimized for ease of, ease of use rather than, for example, for preventing Zoom bombing. I think that most of us, if we're starting a video app, would start with the same defaults but I think that Zoom's lack of foresight and Zoom's sort of lack of imagination and bad things that could happen as they were growing quickly and the obsession with growth definitely left a bit of taste in many of our mouths. <laughs> Somebody's writing, why are we using Zoom, Zoom for this meeting? And I will get to this in a moment. Uh, Lukas, exactly, this is the question. So why we use Zoom and what do you think uh, happened one hour ago when we were hacked? What was it? What is your theory? I will, I'll jump to this in a moment, okay? Oh, sure, of course. I'll jump to this in a moment, because I, I do want to get like, I already have a big conclusion of why we're still using Zoom in spite of all those things, and why I would, in spite of all those things, still recommend that most people do use Zoom. I think that the other thing is, there's something like crisis communication 101. If you are the CEO of Zoom, as Eric here is, one of the things that you probably shouldn't be doing is tweeting and retweeting articles about how good and secure Zoom is. Zoom has actually taken a really long time to own and acknowledge the security mistakes they have made. This is another red flag. And if you're choosing a product, if you're doing like due diligence for your own security products, the way a company communicates can be either a huge red flag or a huge, huge green flag. In many ways, in Zoom's case, this was a huge red flag. In many, in other ways, Zoom has improved massively over the last week or so. So the University of Toronto Citizen Lab, they published a long series of bugs in Zoom. And what happened with those bugs in Zoom is that some companies will ignore security researchers. The really, really bad companies will even threaten legal action against security researchers. But what Zoom did was they very, very open, much owned up to those mistakes. They said, Thank you. Thank you so much for telling us about those bugs. We will fix them. And they fixed them very, very quickly. Not only this, but most startups are obsessed with features, features, features. Zoom actually for the next 90 days said, you know what? We are not putting in any features. We are just going to focus on just security and just privacy. And they also hired, as you can see by the other post, Alex Stamos. 
he he's a very very interesting security person who used to work for facebook and he is has just been hired by zoom as a consultant so even i think if zoom's marketing in the, a month ago was pretty bad i think that in the past couple of days it has improved a lot all of the security scrutiny is helping people are really finding security bugs in zoom and i think that the company could very much have a privacy turnaround not only this, but one of the big issues is if you, for example, a system administrator, you need to realize is that people will use the tools that work. And currently, there isn't really a, an alternative that works on a large scale as well as Zoom does. Like Google Hangouts just isn't there yet. Jitsi Meet has lots of issues. Uh, WebEx isn't as user friendly. And one of the rules is that if you don't give people usable software, they will, in general, try to figure out workarounds. So I love this quote by a system administrator who essentially wrote that they virtually eliminated all unauthorized third party media player downloads on a 50 office enterprise network by pre-installing VLC on every machine. You know, VLC like the cone, the traffic cone media player that, that sort of plays almost every type of media. What is happening in the past is that people when they were on business trips would install all sorts of sketchy media players because they just wanted to watch a movie to go on a business trip when they were traveling on a business trip. That's normal. People want to watch movies and they definitely don't want to be carrying around two laptops just to have a personal laptop to watch a movie. This happens all the time. And in general, in security, if you don't give people tools that work and tools that are usable, in 90% of cases, unless those people are super, super at risk, like military personnel or investigative journalists, what will happen is that people will just find and download their own tools. So the New York City School District, for example, can do this. I think that for a lot, Google can, to a certain extent, do this because they've got their own messaging infrastructure. But for a lot of companies, if you just ban Zoom meetings, what will happen is that employees will continue to use Zoom meetings. They will just not tell IT about any of the Zoom meetings. And the worst thing that you can do in security is have people use unauthorized products and be too scared about uh, and be too scared to be honest about them. So it's much better to give people something that's slightly less secure, but have very, very honest communication with your users than not have this at all. So yeah, so this is one, so this is essentially the reason why we are using Zoom. It's high quality. There's nothing currently, I think, that can replace the quality of Zoom, that can replace the convenience of Zoom. And quite frankly, for a lot of organizations, if they did ban Zoom, people would still use Zoom. They just wouldn't tell systems administrators about it. But at the same time, defaults matter. Defaults matter a huge, huge amount. And whenever we're using Zoom, we can take a couple of proactive steps. One of those is just sort of hardening our Zoom installation. So what happened in the previous meeting was that the meeting ID was shared and somebody entered the meeting with the meeting ID and started logging in with a lot of different accounts in order to disrupt the meeting. This is by default, for example, Zoom didn't allow the ability to mute all participants. You have to enable this. Zoom by default allowed anybody to draw and annotate on the screen. And Zoom by default did not require a password. All of those defaults made it very, very user-friendly. All of those defaults also meant it was very easy for somebody to instantly join instantly join with 20 different accounts, instantly join with 20 different accounts and start to annotate the screen, and instantly unmute themselves the moment they were muted. So defaults matter. Zoom has been pretty bad at setting defaults. I think that Zoom can be considered reasonably secure if we make sure that all of the, default, that all of the defaults are slightly tightened. One of the problems is that whenever you introduce a level of security, you introduce a level of friction. Nobody likes entering passwords. Everybody feeds being in waiting rooms. But defaults do matter a lot. And whatever small trade-offs we have in inconvenience now will save us from a lot of headaches later on because this meeting has not been hijacked and fingers crossed, it will not be hijacked in the future. Once again, your threat model is not my threat model. There are places where Zoom is unacceptable. If you've got military clients, I think that Zoom is coded so badly that you probably shouldn't have it on your device. If you are working with very, very sensitive population, if you're at risk of very high level attacks, I wouldn't say have Zoom on your device. If you absolutely have to use Zoom on your device, have it installed on a separate device 
or have it installed just on a mobile phone because in general, mobile phone architecture is more secure. I would say that for example, for 90 plus percent of people assembled in this room, Zoom is good enough. And in fact, Zoom is probably necessary because it's currently the only sort of massively user-friendly piece of video chatting infrastructure that we have that can handle 100 plus participants. So yeah, this is sort of the end of the main part. I would love to get as many questions from you as possible. I know that the shift to remote work has taken a lot of us by surprise. And I'm sure that you've got a huge amount of digital security questions. So please, if you have any, just throw them at me. Franak, I can see that you're itching to ask something. Yes, I'm, I'm always asking something. Lukas, can you stop sharing the screen so we can see your, uh, your face? Uh, so uh, the major question is about uh, Zoom, of course. So did you mention, uh, do you know anything about the servers in China? So Nikolai Quantaliani, who is also a digital security expert from Belarus, our colleague, he's saying that Zoom has uh, servers in China and one to 28 bit encryption. Is it true? Um, so yes, the servants in China I have seen. I have not done a lot of research on how deep of a threat this is, so I would need to check it again. In general, um, a bigger threat than where the servers are located is the fact that the servers can see everything that passes through them because it's not end-to-end -end encrypted, right? And it also depends on what your threat model is. For some people, China is a threat model. For some other people, China is not a threat model. So that's definitely something to look at. The 120 bit stuff is a bit, that's interesting. So like Zoom is using a slightly different encryption protocol, which works differently with compression. So this essentially means that if somebody observes the network traffic, even if they cannot decode the content of the packets, they can still, for example, figure out how quickly I'm talking, or they can figure out spaces like long silences. I don't think that this is a huge, huge security flaw. I think that it's still something worth considering. It shows that like when Zoom was focusing on building the product, the first thing that was on the mind was growth and not security. Like Signal, for example, is the very opposite, right? Signal has been very slow in adding new features because they've been so paranoid about security. And it feels for me like Zoom and Signal are case studies of two opposite products, whereby Signal has sometimes been adding features at a frustratingly slow pace because the main thing that they want to do is make sure that every single bit of it is very, very secure. So for example, signal, the Signal team still requires phone numbers rather than usernames because they just haven't figured out a way by which uh, you can make usernames that are secure and that no metadata is shared. Because in general, if you have phone numbers, everybody has everybody's phone number saved on the phone in their address book. If you have usernames, you have to sort of, you know, switch between users and you have to figure out which username is associated with which device, which generally requires a server that knows who is who. Uh, for Signal, this is too much metadata collection. This is a super, super paranoid level, but it shows you how hardcore really, really good security design is. And for a lot of people, really, really secure design like this just has too many usability trade-offs and they will not use it. Every product has trade-offs between usability and security. Zoom has very much taken a usability angle. Now I think that they are doing an emergency course correction for security. Uh, Somebody's written, what about alternatives to Zoom? Microsoft, uh, yes. Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts, and Discord. Uh, so before, before and, you answer this yeah? question, uh, Lukas, before you answer this question, uh, and thank you, Ashrin and for for uh, raising this issue. I want to challenge you, Lukas. Why Please. try to convince me that uh, all these attacks by German governments, you know, by all these uh, companies that prohibit to use Zoom to their employees, it's not the conspiracy by um, Google and Microsoft Teams and Cisco Webex against very successful startup Zoom. They're just trying to destroy the competitor. And this is why I know they multiply these messages, you know, that Zoom is unsecured. Perhaps they are unsecured, but they want to destroy competitor because it's getting popular. Try to convince me. This is such, such a good question, right? And I think that, so first of all, how do we actually decide whether or not something's secure? And one of the things is definitely that when a new product appears on the blog, people will probably try to poke a lot of holes in it the amount of security holes that they poke in it is not a testament to how secure or insecure the product is. It's also a testament to how many security holes they have found within it. 
So I think that sort of there has definitely been a huge, huge amount of security researcher attention on Zoom. One of the interesting things is that very few of those critiques have actually come from the big companies like Microsoft and Google and the like. A lot of those have come from independent security researchers. A lot of them have come from um, groups like the like the Canadian University. I think it's the University of Toronto that has the amazing uh, program on digital security. If, for example, it was Google's bug finding pro program, Project Zero that was finding a lot of them, then I would sort of understand, and then maybe I would believe I would believe your theory a bit more. I think that from the very architecture of Zoom it's very, very visible that they went for very, very fast growth at the expense of security at first. I don't think that that's an irrational thing. I think that most startups will do so from the very beginning. Most startups will have pretty bad privacy at the beginning and pretty bad security because the main goal is user acquisition and only then do they pivot a bit more towards security. I think that Zoom has made a lot of those very, very similar choices. The other products are more established. None of them can beat Zoom on video quality and the like, right? But I think that in many cases, the security bugs have been well documented. First of all, they, the security bugs have been really well documented. The second thing is that a lot of them are based on defaults that other programs don't have. Like a lot of it, like what happened uh, an hour ago wasn't a response of like a security bug in Zoom. It was more that Zoom's defaults were designed for user growth rather than sort of for uh, people. Yeah, they were designed for user growth rather than for absolute security. And each one of those companies is doing trade-offs like this, and Zoom went for the growth trade-off. And uh, uh, thank you, Lucas. So, so Ashrina Dershinskaya, she's asking: so alternatives to Zoom. So, can you create? Can you propose your own rating of security of others than Zoom uh, messengers in terms of security, of course? So, what is the most secured? What is less? And what is the least? I mean, the first question is, Flanak, have I convinced you? Ah, you convinced me. You convinced me. <laughs> uh, okay, perfect. You perfect. convinced me fully. I, I, I know it very well as well, because when you want to get uh, fast growth, you have to make mm -hmm. concessions. But if you are a huge Microsoft company and you have government contracts, of course, you know, every piece, every, very, every small risk or small mistake can cost you millions and uh, uh, millions of dollars. This is why yeah. for Microsoft, the security will be always priority. And for Zoom, the growth will be priority. Exactly. And for yeah. us, the customers, we have just to, to decide what we want. Bigger quality and one link to, to easily log in or better security, which says that we don't have whiteboard, that we don't have virtual background and other features proposed by lesser secured app. Precisely. Precisely. And I mean, not only this, but I think that the other thing that's quite valuable to add here is that this applies to every single security product. That like every product that you do will have this huge trade-off between security and usability. And it's all up to you to figure out which sort of trade-off you're the most comfortable with. It's a bit like we talked with cloud backups, right? So some of you will be will mostly communicate and have, let's say, really valuable family photos or memories that you don't want to lose. And for those people, cloud backups are amazing. For those who care a lot about security, you might prefer you know, to risk losing data because you are much, much more scared of data falling into the wrong hands rather than you losing data. OK, but enough about this. Alternatives to Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts, and Discord. First of all, I know very, very little about the security of Discord, so I cannot possibly comment about this. Unfortunately, like one of the things that will disappoint you very, very much is that security researchers in general need to focus need to focus on one or two products because understanding one or, one or two products is complicated enough as it is. Understanding every single product on the marketplace is much more difficult. I've never heard much about Discord security. Personally, I wouldn't trust it that much, but that's also because I haven't just used the product this much. But I'm I'm more than happy to research it. And if you like want to have a follow up session where we go for different tools. Or if you want to have like a group chat where you actually sit down together and do due diligence or do security research about a tool to learn how we actually determine the security of the tool, I would absolutely love to do that. Microsoft Teams in general, are you excited, Flanak? I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Microsoft Teams in general is pretty good. I think, yeah, I, I like with, with Microsoft Teams, it's pretty good with Google Hangouts as well. 
I think that both Microsoft Teams and Google Hangouts have one huge plus, and this is that you can just communicate or just open stuff to people in your domain, right? So if, for example, let's say, let's say that, for example, digital communications network was running on Office or it was running on Google Docs, then you could, for example, create meetings that are only open to people with a digital communications network login. This is amazing for locking down your meetings. This would definitely prevent what's happened in the past, but it also makes it much, much more difficult to keep the meeting open. The moment you start opening meetings to people outside of your domain is the moment problems emerge. Not only this, but I think that like, unfortunately, Google Hangouts just doesn't have the same, just doesn't have the same video quality. It just doesn't have the same usability. The thing is Zoom works and I haven't just come across a product which can do a lot of things at once, which can broadcast video to a huge amount of people at once and works as effectively as Zoom does. That's the, that's the sad truth, unfortunately. Thank uh, you. So I, currently, I just don't think that there's that much competition in this space to be fair. The other thing that someone or the one of you asked is password managers like LastPass. Yes, please, 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 please use a password manager. Like almost every security professional will advise you to use a password manager. From time to time, there will come a security professional who will tell you, but your password manager could get hacked. That's when you know that you're dealing with a bad security professional who doesn't know security and you should ignore them. There's two possibilities of an attack. One of those is that your password manager gets hacked and all your password gets exposed. The other one is that you are so scared of using a password manager that you use easily guessable, repeatable passwords for everything. The scenario where you use easily repeatable passwords and for example, passwords leak from one site to another is much, much, much higher than using a password manager. So almost all security professionals recommend password managers because one of the main risks that happens is that websites will get broken into and passwords will get leaked. So if, for example, let's say that I was logged into a little forum about Zoom security and my Zoom security forum was hacked and the passwords were leaked and I was using not the same password, but a similar password, for example, for Facebook or Google, then based on this, somebody could probably guess my password for Facebook or Google. If I use password manager and have long random passwords, then this is much, much, much more secure. I don't think that there's ever been a break-in at a leading password manager where passwords were leaked. There have been plenty of break-ins at leading sites where passwords were leaked from the site. There have almost never been any break-ins, if any. I don't remember any break-in in history right now where passwords were leaked from a password manager. The other thing as an added layer of security please, please use two-factor authentication. So like, if you can, use your phone or physical security key. I got one here, give me a moment. Of course, I keep my security closed. So like, this is a physical security key. It's an incredibly clever device. You plug it into your USB port. And what it does is that you need to press this button on the security key, in addition to typing in the password to log in. What it does essentially with the security key is that it, make, it, it essentially makes the site almost unfishable. Because somebody could, for example, set up fake gmail.com, which looks just like Gmail and gets your password and maybe gets your two-factor authentication code. If your two-factor authentication code arrives by the app, you could have fake gmail.com, you type in your password into fake gmail.com, then it's like, please enter your two-factor code from your app. And you type your two-factor code as well. But on the other side, somebody could be waiting and actually taking over your two-factor code and typing it into real gmail.com in, re in almost real time. If you're using a security key like this, the security key will only allow you to log in to the real gmail.com, never to the fake gmail.com. It's cryptographically designed never to send the code to the fake page. So this is like an additional advanced level of protection if you don't have a physical key, Gmail has a cool feature where you can use Bluetooth as well, or alternatively, you can use the code on the app. I would not recommend, if you, if you don't have an app, use SMS codes, but the app is much, much more secure than SMS codes. So if, you, if, you, if SMS codes are better than nothing, the app is more secure than SMS codes, 
and the physical key or the Bluetooth key on your phone are even more secure than the app or SMS code. When it comes to the password managers, I'd say most of the major ones are pretty good. Like LastPass, uh, OnePassword, KeyPass, KeyPass XC, all of them are pretty good. One of the things is KeyPass only stores stuff on your local machine. It never stores it in the cloud. I think like, I don't personally see a huge difference, but a lot of people are much more comfortable with having their own passwords managed by themselves rather than on the cloud. So I think that for a lot of people, key, the KeyPass XC, I think it's called KeyPass XC model is the most manageable one. Like I would say that, you know, the normal ones, LastPass and OnePassword are really, really good as well. Just, you know, Google for them, figure out what opinions people have on them, read up a bit about them, Google the name of the password manager and security, maybe search Twitter for it, just do your due diligence a little. And as I said, if you wanted to do like a case study on how to do due diligence of digital tools, I would love to do it. Please email Franak and ask him to start a session like this. Is somebody or also, what? No, I'm just, I wanted to wrap up because we are already like more than one hour, so. No, we are we having so much fun? Yeah, <laughs> okay. No, but it's just the beginning of the series, you know. I think we will uh, have a separate session about uh, Zoom security, about keychains, about the passwords. So I think, you know, we have to develop the whole series of workshops so we can invite those who are working with this on a daily basis. What do you think, Lukash? Is definitely. I mean, yeah, definitely. So one of the things that I'd love to do is to sort of have like a case study, for example, where we meet and actually have a discussion on how do we choose a VPN or something? How do we make a decision on which VPN or which messenger to choose? How do we research the security? Because this due diligence process is actually something really big and something that's not very well documented. So I hope that as many of you can join it as possible. Final, so if you have any last minute questions, please type them in. Automatic password of Apple's keychains, are they secure or too predictable? I would say that for 99.99% of cases, they're secure. And yeah, I would say that, you know, using the automatic passwords by your password manager, I, I think that they are, they are almost as secure as you can get. Theoretically, you know, if you wanted to, you could always like design your own random number generator. I don't think that there's anybody who has such high security requirements that you'd need to design your own random number generator. I know that some people buy like casino quality casino quality dice, but other than that, I think that sort of the random selections by your by your laptops and phones are more than good enough. As long as you know they are long, they can like you. You don't need to have a password. You can have, for example, a passphrase. You can have four or five or six random words, and that can be super secure as well. But your password manager's recommendations are usually pretty good as long as they're long enough. Any more questions? Um, no, there is only a great idea of workshops by Justina Doriaz Buhak, uh, from, from Poland, I suppose. Uh, so let's plan the series of workshop and uh, we definitely, uh, see the big demand for this kind of workshop. Uh, Lukas, you are the great trainer. You're a fantastic speaker. I think, uh, this video will be recorded and will be published on YouTube and Facebook. And we will make sure all the people from DCN community and communities around the globe will have access to this video. Uh, I'd like to thank you so much for, for, for your time and for um, for this uh, a bit stressful situation two hours ago when we were. Oh, no, I, I, think, I think it's taught us a lot. If somebody wrote that you need a three week course, if you do want me to do a three week course, just like message Franak, Franak will message me and like, I'm sure it will arrange it. Christos, thanks for this idea too. Uh, no, let's let's definitely share idea. If you want some topic to be covered as the part of DCNC series, let us know. Ideas, speakers, um, topics, let Nikos, let Lukas, let me, let uh, Vlad Spencer, let us know. Uh, again, thank you so much, our attendees, for participating in this in this conversation. The video will be available. You will receive the um, a feedback form uh, where you can also get slides from Lukas. Uh, we are grateful to to our partners from World Learning. We are grateful to uh, Office of uh, Cultural and Educational Exchanges of State Department for supporting Digital Communication Network. And um, yeah, let's be in touch. Let's work together and let's make digital great again. <laughs> and secure. Make digital and secure, secure again.
<laughs> yes, let's make digital security again. Thank you all so much and um, have a good night. Have a good rest. Of thank you. Have, have a good great day. evening. And thank you so much for coming an hour late and adjusting your schedules to it. You are all awesome. Thank you.